Okay, if you remember from last week, we were looking at task one. And task yeah. one asks you to produce your presentation on PowerPoint with supporting notes in which you detail how external factors can impact on the business environment. And it's describing a range of external factors, explaining why business organizations choose to carry out a pestle analysis, describe the three-step crisis management procedure and identify factors which contribute towards environmental damage. And then explain how factors contribute to our environmental damage can be minimized and how a lack of care of the environment can affect a business's profitability and reputation. So I haven't done the last point. You've only got the last one to do. Yeah. yeah? Right, well. And then for the merit and for the distinction, I haven't done yet as well. Yeah. The the bits on, on there, for looking at, at the reputation, this is a, a, quite a new phenomenon. And it's been mainly caused by um, social media. People now have access to other people who have dealt with a company. Uh, they can find information about that company very quickly. And mm -hmm. um, I don't know if you remember, um, last year it was, uh, Starbucks were pulled up by not paying the correct amount of tax um, to UK. Um, and not just UK, but other com countries that were in. They were avoiding tax uh, and funneling, funneling what tax they did pay back to America. Um, and it had a very detrimental effect within within absolutely within a week. Um, the, the sales dropped off um, noticeably. It's recovered since um, because people have short memories. But that's the sort of thing. Um, anything um, that can affect the environment or uh, can affect um, how people feel about a company um, can impact very quickly nowadays on the business through the use of social media. People from across the world can speak to each other now, where before that wasn't possible. So yeah, that environmental impact can have um, an extremely uh, detrimental effect. And of course, it works the other way. If they're known to be an ethical company and um, help the environment, and any news of what they do in that fact can affect, again, their reputation. They, you know, people think, yeah, they're great. Mm -hmm. So that was the first part, and if that's the only bit you've got left to do you now, that's you've done very well. Um, on the extension activities, did you? Uh, did, are you going to attempt these? Yeah. Yeah. Go. Cool. Okay. Yeah. Well, the, the, again, you need to complete a pestle analysis. Um, I mean, now you've gone through that on the earlier PowerPoint. You probably, you know understand what you need to put into that. And then you choose an organization uh, that you're going to do a pestle analysis on. Uh, and it, it needs to be uh, an organization where you can get the information e easily, or, or all the public um, information is in the public domain, sorry. Um, so that is, it's important that you pick one that you can get the information for. Yeah? Well. To go for a distinction, you prepare three leaflets, um, which the chamber is going to be able to use, um, and which are going to be displayed in reception. Make recommendations for dealing with external opportunities and challenges facing an actual organization that you've chosen. Evaluate how, a, how your chosen organization has managed a specific crisis and make recommendations to a chosen organization how to reduce their environmental impact. And again, usually, I mean, it's purely up to you who you choose, but um, quite often supermarkets are ideal because the bags of information about them, you can you know, find out very easily on the net what they've got and what, how they are uh, dealing with things, any, any difficulties they've had. All of those are usually available quite easily on the net. Um, so it's, it's um, just a good way of finding that information out. But yeah. if you've got another organization who you can get that from and you're more familiar with it, then that's fine. No problem at all. It's any of your choice. So you're quite happy with what you need to do for those now, yeah? Yep. Yeah. 
Good. Task two, moving on, is our Chamber of Commerce has asked um, you to produce a booklet on marketing that can be distributed to a small businesses in the local area. The booklet must include the following. An explanation of the function of marketing and how it is different from selling. Do you know can do you know the difference between uh, marketing and selling? Uh, yeah. Well, that's saves me a bother. <laughs> yeah. Lots of people don't understand the difference between the two. But marketing is is in the advertising section. It's not actually advertising, but it's part of it is advertising. Um, but marketing it is putting everything in place to to be able to sell. Yeah, and, and selling obviously selling. Um, he has asked specifically to get add examples here of an explanation of the differences between internal and external data and information, and an explanation of the differences between primary and secondary information. Well, those two run together actually. Um, internal and external data is data you get from inside the organisation and how it's used and how it's transferred within the organisation itself. And external data is data that's used from other companies where they benchmark against another company uh, and, and try to find out um, what their aims and, uh, and information is so that if they're in competition. Uh, an explanation of the difference between primary and secondary information, that is similar to when you do research. Uh, primary information is information that you get yourself and secondary information is one that you pick up from other data, yeah, from elsewhere from reading, from books, from information, magazines, whatever. Yeah. yeah. So that's fairly straightforward on, on task two. The marketing booklet is um, literally PowerPoint. You can use PowerPoint again to put, um, put the pages in that format if you wish to do that. Um, but you can also do them in, in, in Word format on, on a page. It's purely for yourself which way you do that. To gain the merit, you are required to provide additional sections to the booklet to describe the elements of the marketing mix, giving specific examples from an organization you have selected again, yeah? yeah. And how organizations use the information that has been collected for marketing purposes. To get a distinction, you must choose the business organization which you are familiar, Using your chosen organization, you are required to provide an additional section of the booklet that evaluates a specific marketing campaign used by an organization you have selected. One of the ones that um, spring to mind, to just give you some ideas, um, one of the, um, I can't even remember which one it was now, one of the hotels chains uh, that deal in you know, one night stays and things like that, had Lenny Henry advertising uh, their services, but they also the fact that they put, I think it was Hypnos beds in uh, as, as a, a sort of drawing for people um, to have a, a comfortable night, especially business people if they've been working all day. So again, that's just an idea, but that's the sort of thing it's looking for on that. Right. Now I'll just put this to one side a minute. There's ample um, resource on here within this section um, to look at, um, I'll give you the ideas on there, um, examples of marketing objectives, yeah? Okay. Every business plan needs a section, marketing objectives. This is the spot. In the business plan, the small business owner details how he's going to move forward, yeah? how he's going to market the new venture, and illustrates why business is a, is a solid choice. Yeah? Without proper marketing objectives, finding funding for a business venture of this nature is, is nearly impossible. Most of the, uh, if you go to any of the, I'll put them down as money supply, it may be a bank, it may be uh, any sort of funding um, proposition. 
Um, if you go to them without a solid marketing objective of your good or service, whatever it is, yeah, uh, they'll give you a turn down. They want to see why you are rating it so highly and why you need the money for it. It will it, the return on the investment has got to be very clear. And without that marketing plan, how are you going to get there? Um, you know, it's just obvious that they're going to give you the money. Yeah. So, again, when you put those objectives down, they need to be real objectives, realistic objectives, achievable ones. Um, because anybody can say, oh, I want to I I make a million pounds in this next 12 months. Yeah, but how are you going to do it? It's like I've, I've seen sales managers say to the sales team, um, okay, we need to double our turnover next uh, in the next um, section. Without putting additional resources in, there's absolutely no way that's achievable. Um, so if you've got six salesmen and they're working at maximum and you want to you want to double what they do, you need another six salesmen. Uh, and that's a marketing objective to start more people so that you can get more work out. So again, realism is absolutely uh, important. So we're looking at this as smart, if you remember. Realistic, measurable. Again, it's got to be measured. How do you know when you get in there? How the pathway towards that, that goal, um, how is it to be measured? How do you know whether you're falling short or whether you're going, you, you know, you're sailing through this and you need to change your objective. It may need to raise the stakes a little. Yeah. And there's got to be some sort of time limit on it. Yeah. Um, it's got to be over a specific period, yeah. Not just sort of, well, well, we'll we'll try and do it in the next 12 months or something. It needs to be focused, yeah. So your market objectives need to be achieved within a certain amount of time. Um, like it says on here, I'll make a million someday, um, including the fourth P, four P's now. Four P's of marketing, you probably, if, you, if you've done any marketing work at all, you'll know exactly what those are, product, price, promotion, and place. Each of these four things need to be included in your objectives. So what is the product or service? What is its price? How are you going to promote it? And where is it going to be sold? Is it going to be sold on the street? Is it going to be sold in a shop? Is it going to be sold uh, on the net? You know, there are a whole range of things now in, in terms of place that are, are, it's made it one of the more important P's now. Um, so basically, you're giving all the information, yeah, that you possibly can. Okay. But. So we'll have a look at this one. These are some examples. So again, marketing plan objectives. Oh, so this is what I'm just covered on it. <laughs> Sorry about that. It's a full piece. I've gone back on the wrong one. So to basically selling is one one to one communication between a seller. Uh, it is one of the most expensive forms of promotion. Uh, it's like um, you could look at one of the cheapest ways of promotion is word of mouth, and this is where again social media can come in on this because people talk to each other across distance now, and if they've got um, if they've had a very good result from uh, an organisation, they're going to tell people about it. And that word of mouth is for nothing. It costs you absolutely nothing. 
uh, whereas like one to one trying to sell something is quite expensive. Examples, personal meetings, telemarketing, emails and correspondence. So advertising is a form of personal promotion, but it spreads it out. Uh, they'll then pay to promote the ideas, goods or services in a variety of media outlets. It can be found everywhere, and advertising, um, I mean, that, that above, that picture above is a good example. Um, advertising everywhere. Um, you met with it on the street, you met with it in your home, on TV, uh, you met with it every time you pick a newspaper up, everything uh, on the net. Now, uh, one of the, one on the net now, one of the big bugbears is that you get a load of advertising all the way down the side. It's got to the point now where you have to pay if you want to go um, have the less, basically. Um, that can be um, a good thing in some ways because you will see things on the net when you're browsing through something else, or even if you're working sometimes, um, it can be a light relief if something comes on that you're interested in, and well, I haven't thought about that, and you'll pick something up from there where you wouldn't have actually done anything about it if it had been left to yourself. So direct marketing, uh, as you know, is through the letterbox, the stuff that comes through the, um, the door, basically, on a daily basis. Um, one of the it's, well, this is, depends on how you look at it. Um, I find it very uh, annoying is that you get cold calling by telephone. They pick the number of people's telephone number up, and then you get these spurious phone calls uh, on a sort of hourly basis sometimes about subjects that you're not even interested in. Uh, how they get you, your number, I don't know. But you can now actually uh, find a way of having those cut out. Um, but they are, can be a nuisance if, you've, if you're waiting for a phone call, for instance, uh, and you, you've got to wait and see who it is, um, because a lot of the um, of this type of marketing, they're done from a centre, which means that when you pick the phone up, there's not an immediate answer. Um, the, the several seconds go by before somebody answers. The minute you know that, you can put the phone down because it's not something you're interested in, especially if you're waiting for a call or something of that nature. So it can be annoying as well. Sales promotions used to be on regular times throughout the year. There'd be a sale um, before Christmas. There would be a sale in January of stuff that wasn't sold at Christmas. There'd be a, a sale in, at the end of summer, of, of all the summer wear and things like that that were, were uh, now unsold and now being sold off for a, a cost, basically, to, to, to get rid and to buy new stock in for the autumn and winter. So those are the sort of things that um, you'll see in terms of sales promotion. Okay. Other, other, other ones, um, product samples, coupons, uh, any displays, point of purchase, Sometimes you'll get um, people at a railway station, or, uh, larger ones, uh, will be offering a free try of a bar of this or something of that or a packet of something. Um, the, the absolute um, point of purchase displays, basically, but you don't have to purchase for those. They'll do just extra advertising as well as getting you to try uh, the sample. Something you perhaps wouldn't have done if you hadn't been accosted at a, a railway station or bus station uh, by one of these people um, offering the samples. Public relations activities. This is again links back to what we were talking about in, in one. Um, public opinion is very important nowadays, so therefore, Public relations activities enable an organisation to influence the target audience. Most of the time, public relations company campaigns try to create a favourable image of the company, its products and its policies. Companies do news releases, handouts, anything of that nature to, to announce um, anything that's going on, any news that they've got, uh, that they will use in many channels. Um, 
advertising in football grounds, where it's, there's something at, at least flying around the circuit uh, around the, while you're watching the match. And subliminally, you're picking that information up. Um, you're not actually reading what it says on there. But I bet if somebody asks you when you watch the match, what was some of the advertising on there, you'd be able to say. You hadn't actually read it, but the information had been stored in your subconscious just by zooming around the, uh, the inside of the, uh, the, 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 the uh, playing wall uh, while the match is on. So all these are things or tactics um, to get the public to recognize we are a good firm, use us, our services are the best, and any, any information that they can bring to the public. Anything that they do, um, a lot of supermarkets now, even at local level, get involved in things locally, working with schools or working with the local council, um, and also any, any donating or any time that they spend or, or services that they provide for good causes at zero cost. Um, is obviously uh, a good way of, uh, of you know absorbing, absorbing um, public acknowledgement of what they do. So these um, again um, are informative sheets, but they're also idea sheets because again they will they will list a number of ways of doing things. Uh, and it'll just act as an aid memoir for you. So, oh, yeah, I can use that and then move forward with it. Yeah. All right. I'm going to look at this one at the bottom because this is um, often mistaken. Um, Culture in an organization is rather less than the people in it, but the way it operates, um, the way the people in the organizing, organization feel about working for it, yeah? whether it feels quick and responsive, or old and backward looking, whether it is authoritarian for people that work there, or whether it is completely laissez fair, where they just let you get on with it. Um, there are a whole host of different things. And there are there is a list of now of um, companies that you like, um, and it will list uh, you know, one to ten companies that the public in general feel good about, and also the best firms to work for. Um, and that is becoming also very important now um, because attracting one of the main things with any business if you, if you, that you are running is attracting the right people into it. Quite often you will have a number of people that come to interview and some may have less qualifications or maybe less qualified for the job. But if you're looking to fit them into a team as an employer, you will be looking, you know, this, this person's a good fit. You might have somebody with the top qualifications and recommendations and everything else, but the important thing coming through an interview is that they ain't going to fit in this team because, you know, it, the, the way they respond to how you're asking the questions is totally different than what you would expect that would fit in with the rest of the group. So it's important that um, when an employer is um, looking for people, that he gets the right people. And if, the, if he's getting results on the internet and also on uh, social media, that, well, this, this guy's not a good person to work for. He does this, that, and the other. And people get that information now before they actually go for, go for a, 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 apply to a company. So obviously the ones with the nicer culture um, is the one more likely to attract good people. Oh, I'm out this morning. So looking at culture, um, one of the ways of looking at this is 
what it's doing, whether it is roll orientated or backward looking, whether it's, it, it, it's looking at a powerful uh, uh, management team, whether it's forward looking, whether it's people orientated and task orientated, so that people like to work there, they're looking, they're forward looking, and they know what they've got to do. Many companies suffer from management that does not give clear, well, clear information on what is needed. Yeah, it's just um, a lot of I, I've seen you know, worked in, in companies where managers just sort of said, "I want that doing by then, get on with it," and no support, no further information, not really uh, clear management. Um, it doesn't work, and it, people usually leave quite quickly. I think I stayed there uh, for, I think it was four weeks. <laughs> but anyway, I digress. But that's, I'm just giving an example of, of what happens in culture. Um, people like to, um, looking at ter the terms of what people like within an organization, um, would you be surprised if I told you that um, the wage or the money came about fifth? in the list, fifth of in, list of importance. Um, when you work somewhere, it's important that you feel valued, um, that you can see that there is somewhere to go, you've got opportunities within the company, and you are supported. Those are the main, major factors that people look at within, uh, when, they're, when they're working within a company. The wage comes, about, as I said, about fifth. So it's very important um, that um, you know you look at that as, a, as an employee or a prospective employee. You need to look at that with the company. I've worked in a lot of different companies. Um, I was an engineer before I became a teacher, and I worked for one company for over 30 years. And then because they moved to France and didn't and wanted me to move, and I didn't want to go, I left. Um, but after that, I never stayed anywhere more than two years until uh, I found one company where I ended up staying four years because I liked it. Um, but then my, my ethos was to move each, each every two years to gain more experience and knowledge, which I did. But that was my choice, yeah, not somebody else's. Power culture firm is a key element. Decisions are made by one or a small number of people and then told to get on with it. Yeah. Power culture is used to found in small organisations or in a sector or department belonging to a large organisation. This is difficult because it's hard to run a large organisation with only a small number of people. It's like a college like ours. We couldn't, uh, we couldn't operate on um, a power culture. We, even though it's only a small company and it's saying on there that that would reflect that, um, we have to have a division of labour. <laughs> Who does what is very clear um, because we wouldn't get everything done otherwise because we have many of our teachers have got um, very high qualifications and work in other colleges and some in universities and they work on a part-time basis um, where they're given basically a, a number of things to do and they know what they've got to do and they just get on with it. Um, so it's not like a power culture, but it's not lazy fair where nobody's bothered. The rules are fairly straight, what, who does what and when. Um, it's like, again, another example is um, I'm delivering this um, unit to yourself. Uh, once this unit's um, complete, you'll move on to one of the other tutors and you'll gain experience of different tutor styles and how they operate as well, which gives you further information of how businesses run and how they operate. Yeah. Ultimately, the success of a power culture will depend on the strength of the decisions made. And I, this is what I've said before, I find that when you've got a power culture, it's a sort of, well, that's it, get it done, take it or leave it, and it doesn't actually work too well. Yeah. Role culture, individuals are assigned specific job role. This is how we work. And as well as that, some of the, the, the senior management team have several tasks. I will deliver some business qualifications. I will deliver all the teaching qualifications, et cetera, 
and uh, IQA qualifications. I only do business ones occasionally um, because I've been in management for many years. Um, but I usually do this, this, this part of the unit, uh, explaining about business and how it works and so forth. Um, one of the um, other roles is the, the total quality management within the company. Um, so that is the uh, where, but they are distinct roles, um, and I work on one, and then I work on the other. It's not the two can't be set; uh, the two are separate. They're not not uh, modulus. It's looking at uh, where you've got specialist roles, um, and again, this is how I give you that example. I, I have a specialist role in this particular unit because of my management experience. Um, I teach the teaching qualifications because of my teaching experience, but they are very much um, role orientated. Yeah, uh, Ramon will teach business, and he also teaches um, uh, tourism and hospitality uh, because that's another area of his knowledge. Uh, uh, area of knowledge he has, and we have other tutors that teach IT uh, specifically, and also others that do business as well. So again, they are task uh, and role orientated, very much so. Specialist in sales and marketing. Again, um, Raman, the owner of the business, he's actually he, he's been in sales and marketing many years before he started the business. Therefore, he's got a lot of experience in that area, and those are the areas that he he's, you know spends most time with. Looking at legal compliance, project management, and legal compliance. Specialist roles um, should increase, pro increase productivity as employees are completing the tasks they are fully trained and experienced to do. And that is, that is a, um, a real, imp really important factor. Um, I s have seen over the last 20 years working in different colleges and different organisations is, and it's, it, you can't understand it really to some extent. In engineering, you were promoted if you could do certain tasks and you were given any further training you needed to move on to that, that, that wider scope if you needed to. What colleges tend to do is take a very good lecturer and they'll put him into a management position, give him no training or whatsoever uh, and, and leave him to flounder. Uh, and I found that on, in, that happened on many occasions in uh, in further education. Uh, sadly, uh, hopefully uh, it's changing now as the roles like here become part time and you work for many different organisations, especially delivering online like this. In some cases, like yourself, it's one to one. In some cases, we might have a group of up to eight on on any particular uh, particular course. Right. So role culture may be unsuitable for some organisations with a small number of employees where everyone needs to take on a variety of tasks. That, again, <laughs> is partially us um, because the, the three or four of us in the senior management team um, tend to do about three or four different roles because until we expand even further, then we will probably release some of those roles to more employees as we start, um, as we you know extend, and the more more um, students will be get. Because as the student numbers increase, our task in terms of mine, in terms of quality, and Raman's in, in terms of managing the business, will take up more time, and we'll have to employ tutors to actually deliver the work that we were actually with, you, actually doing before. So uh, the roles will change, or our culture will change within the organisation uh, as it progresses. Task culture is termed the use of teams who complete tasks. This is mainly larger organisations where they have project teams. Um, they will then set and be set a particular task, and um, the staff feel motivated because they know exactly what they've got to do. They're empowered to make decisions for themselves to move along and they feel value because they've been selected for the team. And theirs is a sense of achievement when the team complete a task successfully. It also allows the team to be more creative with problem solving. Um, one of the um, best examples of that I can give you is that recently um, London has had a new 
crossrail service built uh, underground, uh, a massive, massive uh, project in terms of uh, cost and time. It's broken up into sections, and sections are given projects. And the pro one project is, is digging a shaft that's got to complete with a tunnel underneath. Uh, a railway station's got to be built. Parts have got to be built for that railway station. There are, there are a whole host of things where it's broken down into uh, specific projects. And each of those projects will have a yeah, set time scale and the budget. Um, and the project manager uh, involved then has to work very closely with his team um, to make sure that they all achieve. Um, and that is how that sort of operation can function and come back at least uh, not always on budget, but certainly uh, they're usually not far out on time. So that's task culture. Personal culture organisations focus on people working with the organisation. They rely on specialist knowledge of the workforce. Personal cultures are found in organisations where there are opportunities for employees to develop their career skills. Examples include universities where staff can continue their education through their employment. Um, person cultures include legal and accountancy firms where the organisation is selling a specialist skill of the, or its staff. Um, it creates a need for staff to undergo continuous professional development. Teachers do that on a regular basis. Um, most of us have a, a, a CPD plan each year. Even me, at my extended age of 74, um, ha do I have a CD, CPD plan? One of the things I do is to make sure that I am up to date with um, the, the awarding bodies changes in, in, in um, courses or in terms of what the requirements are. Uh, and they run you know, sort of one day courses uh, here and there. Um, to give this information out so that people are up to date. And it's, my CPD plan is usually around that sort of thing now, so that I'm, I am up to date with any or all, all of the changes that are going to be made so that I can reflect those in the way we operate here. So again, that is people um, being supported in moving forward. One of the things I said that um, universities and colleges do not all have a personal culture um, because, as I've said, they, they, they miss out on the bit that they can achieve most with, and that's additional training. Forward looking, entrepreneurial. Um, all small businesses you could look at are in this situation. However much it changes, they get bigger um, without that forward-looking culture. And to some extent, entrepreneurial, um, they've got to try things and, and see if they work to expand. And in that first three, four years of any small business, if it wants to grow, it's got to look forward and look at how they can bring in more income into the company. And that is maybe looking at different ways of bringing income streams into the company um, by doing things that, that are not the, the total focus, but will allow them to do, th they'll bring the, the sort of funding in that will allow them to do things that they want to do and to achieve the goals that they set out to do. This one, backward looking, does not embrace change. Whereas the other one above is all about embracing change and making change where you need to. Um, if you don't make changes or, or external things happen um, within a, an organisation, um, it, it can lead to it closing quite quickly. Um, I worked for a college that was a tier four college that relied on students coming in from abroad on visas. The government changed the rules on visas drastically in 2013-14 and the college closed in 2015 because they didn't look at um, changing the way they operated to, by bringing students in rather than um, just bringing them in from abroad um, because obviously they, 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 as soon as those 
restrictions were put on on visas, the, the uh, supply of students dropped drastically. And again, they didn't do anything about it. So, yeah, lack of risk taking, lack of flexibility, yeah, especially in organisations of public service, organisations but can be the reason why long-standing commercial businesses suddenly go into administration. Just the example I gave you there then, that's the sort of thing that you've got in terms of the effect that the culture within an organisation can, um, can operate. So, yeah. Um, that's the end of that one. I don't want to go back to now, just before we look at that, is the marketing booklet. You're quite, you're quite happy with finishing off the extensions for the, the, uh, the first, the first um, task, yeah? Mm -hmm. Sorry? I missed that <laughs> response. You, you're quite okay with these extension activities for um, task one, yeah? Well, task, task two, you mean? Sorry? You mean task two? No, no, I said you've still got these extension activities to finish for task okay. one, haven't you? Yeah, you're yeah. quite happy with that. You're okay with that, are you? Yeah. 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 So I'm just running over task two again. Yeah. Uh, it's a, it's a, it's a producing a marketing booklet that can be distributed to small businesses in the local area. And it's got to have an explanation of the function of marketing and how it is different from selling a description of the purpose of a marketing plan and, the, and marketing objectives. Um, so, and basically the, so basically the, bo the booklet, I can download it from internet just to make my own information. Yeah, any, any template you want to use is fine. Uh, but then your booklet has got to contain these things, yeah? Okay. Yeah, so you can put on the front page, you can use a template from, from the net anywhere, yeah, um, say marketing booklet or whatever, and, but the information inside that you put inside is an explanation of the function of, and how it's different from selling, a description of a marketing plan, a marketing objectives, um, an explanation of the differences between internal and external data and information, and an explanation of the differences between primary and secondary information. Yeah. So I think today we'll leave it there. I'll, I'll allow you to finish those off, and by all means, any work that you've already done that you want some feedback on, just put it into learner work, and I, it'll come to me, and I will deal with it as uh, soon as I get it, really. Yeah, and I'll send you some feedback on that. Um, you you use um, let me move that out of the way again. Do you use? I think I asked you this last week. You, you're conversant with review. Review are you in Word? Um, what do you mean? Right. When uh, you send me a piece of work in, yeah, um, yeah, I will read through it, and I click on review here, which allows me to put a, a, a window at the side mm -hmm. here, yeah, with the information on. That, that it, it will say anything from you need to look at such and such a thing on, or such and such a thing on needs to be added here, or it may say, excellent, good, that's fine. Uh, and, you know, you can move on from there, you know that's achieved. Yeah. So I will use review on there, and when I send it back to you, it will have these bubbles at the side at the various points with some either information that you need to look at, or it will just say, good, excellent, fine, done, job done. <laughs> what I will then do when, when the, the unit's complete, I will then give you a formal um, assessment of the work um, with you know and saying that it's achieved well done etc and that will then go back into learner work as it's when it's completed uh, and will stay there until you've completed the rest of your units and then you've got the full qualifications already been assessed right. it, will then, it will then have to come back to me except for this unit because i can't uh, quality issue of my own work uh, it will then come back to this unit uh, and what either Ram and I want to do as well, we'll do the IQA on this one. Um, and once that's done, your qualification is complete. That's how it works. So it's piece by piece. We put it together and put it in. So you, as soon as you've got the first task done, 
just send it or even before then, just send it through to me and I'll I'll send you the feedback in that format. But then at the end, as I said, when you finish the unit, I'll give you a formal assessment on there showing where it's complete and why it's complete. Is that okay? Yep. Sure. Have you got any questions before we go today? No, I haven't, no, thank you. Yeah. Okay then, I will speak to you again next week. All right, thank you. Bye for now. Thank you. Have a nice day. Yeah, same to you. Bye now. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.